morning, sir. Would you please state your name and spell it? Abedi Da Silva, A B E D E Da Silva, D A S I L V A. All right. And Mr. Da Silva, um, is your brother Akila? Yes. Were you present the evening that Akila died? Yes, I was. Okay. And you testified in the trial earlier about um, your experience that evening. Um, if I recall your testimony, you were are six years older than me? Yeah, five years, nine months. Okay. Were you close? Yeah. Um, what, what effect has witnessing your brother's last words had on you and your family? Um, I see it every day. I relive it every day. I try, try to block it out, but I can't. Um, you know, my brother, he didn't, he wouldn't even get his ears pierced because the pain. So to know that he had to go through pain in those last moments and I could see it in his eyes and I could see his face, how he looked every day. I mean, I see it every day, how he looked that night. It's just reliving it every day, it just tears me apart. Your, your mother mentioned that you have post-traumatic stress disorder. What, is that what you just described? Is that, does that cause you to have PTSD? Um, yes. Are you having to receive any treatment for it? Um, well, I was doing counseling at one point in time, um, but right now, no. Um, how has it affected your mother? Um, it's changed her. It's changed her a lot. It's changed our whole family. Um, you know, I haven't seen her happy in a long time. She gets up, like she says, every day, fighting and, and you know, trying to do things to keep his memory alive, to fight against gun violence, and, you know, she does it not only to keep his memory alive, but also, you know, as a distraction from the reality of what we go through. And I understand you have two other siblings? Yes. And who, who are they? Um, my younger sister, Amber, my younger brother, Al Dane. How old, are, how old are your younger siblings? Amber's 25, and Al Dane is 15. Okay. Um, are they here? Yes. Have they been here during the entirety of the trial? Yes. Were they also close to Akila? Yeah, they were. So with the regard to Amber, how has this affected Amber? It's affected her a lot. Um, you know, Amber, she tries to stay strong. We're alike, we're so much alike. She tries to stay strong. She tries to hide it, but her and Akila was only two years apart. You know, they were real close. They went to high school together. They grew up together. They, they, were, they were more, I'll say they, when it comes to, she was more close with him because in the age. So it affected her a lot. It, you know, she doesn't talk about it a lot, but um, I know it affects her a lot because of, sometimes she breaks down to my mom, you know. Okay. And, and what about Aldine? Aldine's, he's special, he's different, you know, he's a strong kid. Um, it affected him a lot, but it definitely encouraged him, it motivated him to keep Akilah's name alive. Um, it, it made him involved into gun violence and fighting to change laws. Okay. Yeah. Um, I noticed that throughout the trial, your family has been wearing one particular color. What, what is that? Um, baby blue. And and why? Uh, it was Akilah's favorite color. You see any pictures of him growing up, all the way up to he was an adult. You see him wearing baby blue, baby blue t-shirts, hats, anything. You you don't have on baby blue today though. Yeah, I do, but oh, it's under my shirt. Under your shirt. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> all right. Um, and do you see your brother in the image that just went up briefly? Yes. 
Do you remember him going to prom? Uh, yeah, he was like 17 in this picture. Um, he actually went to prom twice. I think this was like his first time going to prom, if I'm not mistaken, or his second time. On the night that your brother was killed, he was with his girlfriend, Shantia Wagner. Um, do you know if this has had an effect on her? Yeah, it had a big effect on her. Um, you know, at one point in time, that was the only person I could even talk to about the situation because nobody understood what we went through. I can even talk to my mom about it because, you know, I didn't want to open up to her and, you know, just tell her everything that was that happened. So T was like the only person that I could talk to. And it was times that she wanted to give up. It was times that she was just like going through all these surgeries. She just wanted to, they was talking about amputating her leg and she wanted to give up so many times and she was so depressed and her and Akilah, they was, man, I adored their relationship. Like their relationship was beautiful. Like I've never seen two young people in love, like really genuinely in love the way they were in love with each other. She supported everything he did. She supported everything. And I always admired that about her. And I understand one of the things that he did was music. Yeah, he was he was he was a, he, was a, he was a rapper, a videographer, an engineer. He recorded music, he shot the videos, and he was an artist. Yeah. What was his? Uh, did he have a stage name? Matrix, like Matrix with an N, okay. Dream. And and what did that mean? Uh, I, I, I never understood where Matrix came from. <laughs> I never understood where it came from. Um, I just thought it was a cool name. Um, you know. It kind of fit with the dream, the whole baby blue, everything. It just seemed right, you know? He, he had so many different names before Natrix. Natrix was the official name. He had so many names before that. Yeah. And your mother described him making music uh, where he talked about, I guess, being against gun violence. Is that, was that kind of the nature of his music? Yeah, his music was all positivity. He spoke about, like you said, in Prophet, he spoke about stop making hashtags because you know in this time of day people just hashtag something on social media and they keep it pushing so he's like instead of just doing stuff for just social media or just for the internet let's let's really actually put action towards what we're saying and um he never even cursed in his music never cursed never said anything bad everything was positive about his music do you ever expect your brother to be the be a hashtag no, I would never expect this. Is there anything else you think you want to share about how this has affected you and your family? Um, it changed my family. It changed us. It changed our lives completely. Um, my daughter was only two years old when he was when he died. Um, it hurts to know that. I have to remind her who she is through pictures and videos and she'll never get to know who he is. Um, it hurts the fact to see my mother cry and I can't do anything about it. It hurts the fact to know that he died and I didn't. I just never understand. I don't understand what, what I just never understand the significance of this. He didn't deserve it. Dude, um, I think that's what mo most affects us the most, the fact that the type of person he was. And some people say like, why would he not have a gun? He's not that type of person. Brother would never pick up a gun, would never shoot a gun. He don't even like guns. Um, I'll just never understand the fact, I don't know, it just kills me to know that I couldn't do anything about it. The fact that I have to see my mom go through pain every day, it kills me because it's like, I just feel helpless. Um, like I said, it changed our family completely in so many ways. 
It changed every last one of us, all my siblings, my mom, me. It's changed us as a person. Um, I don't know. I just, I'll just never understand. I just never understand, like, if anybody had to go, why it had to be him. Why it couldn't it just be me instead of him? He didn't have any kids. He didn't do anything to anybody. Like... If it was supposed to be like this, I would have rather it been me than him. And the fact that I have to live with that every day is torture. That I have to live like live through that. This is something that I will never be able to get over. I'll never have, be complete. It was a void. There's nothing that could fill that void. I know he didn't want to die. And the fact that he was murdered instead of he didn't even die from a car accident or sickness, he was murdered. He had so much talent, so much gift, so much talent. Like, like, I, like she said, he built his own computer. He learned how to shoot videos on his own, everything, all this stuff he learned how to do off of YouTube. Nobody taught him this. It was just like all this talent taken away for nothing. And it just tears me. Just to know, like, I'll never understand. I'll never get it. And I have to live with this for the rest of my life. And I don't even know how it would affect me later on. Because it has affected me in so many different ways. In different stages. As the years has went by, it's affected me. And it scares me. Because I don't even know. I don't even know, I know how to handle this. I've never been through nothing like this. I never lost somebody so close. <laughs> just don't I'm just going along it's just like live we're just living in a nightmare and I'm just going along just every day is a fight every day I wake up it's a fight I try to be strong because I'm I'm grateful that I'm still here and I know I have to be my brother's voice but it's hard thank you for being his voice thank you Judge, our next witness is D'Angelo Rose. Judge, you would raise your right hand to each one, please. I'm not going to clarify this other church, the whole church, nothing about the church, so help you out. Mr. Groves, you've already testified once in this case, is that right? Yes. And this is the picture that we have already introduced of your sister, Diebody, is that right? Yes. Can you tell us how her murder has affected you personally? Um, so for um, my birthday, we always have this tradition where we go to amusement parks and we ride roller coasters. And um, I've always wanted to go to uh, Cedar Point in Sandusky. And um, so the year before she passed, we went to Six Flags in Georgia. And then um, that following year she passed. And then shortly after that, a few months later, I had a birthday and I actually got to go to Sandusky, Ohio to Cedar Point, but I didn't have my riding buddy with me this time. And um, she's always been my my co-pilot ever since I was able to drive. Um, every time I got in the car, she was always there. Um, there have been times where I've, a couple times I've had dreams about her and she would just show up and 
we would be interacting with each other. And I just remember like in, in those dreams, like it would be so real to me, like that I would cry and I would just be like thanking God that he resurrected her and brought her back to me. Like, that's just how real the interaction was. And then I wake up and I'm like, but I know she's not actually here. There are times when I pull up at my mom's house and I expect to turn the corner and see her car there and her car is not there. Have you seen this impact other members of your family? Yes. Tell us about that. Um, mostly more so with my mom. Um, I know that for a while, I don't know if she still does it or not, but I know for a while that like she would mark on the calendar the days that she would cry. And I just remember feeling helpless because there was nothing that I could do. Because her grief is her grief and my grief is my grief and I will never understand how it feels to carry a child and lose it but I do know for at least the first couple of years um, after her death, like it just literally felt like somebody took a vacuum and just sucked the life out of me. It, it was literally like I lost a piece of me because I, I didn't realize just how intertwined our lives really were until after she passed. And I remember the first Thanksgiving that we had, I showed up to a family dinner and usually I have plenty to say but I remember feeling bad because everybody was standing around and we would take turns like telling something that we were thankful for and that was the first time that I felt bad because I could not even form the words to say that I was thankful for anything That's all, Jack. Our next witness is Albert Groves, Judge. If you would state your name and spell your name for the court reporter. Albert Groves, A-L-B-E-R-T-G-R-O-V-E-S. Sir, how are you related to Ebony Groves? That's my baby girl, my daughter. Can you tell us about how her murder has impacted you? I'm, I'm devastated by this. Uh, I'll just tell you a little story if you don't mind. Uh, she was born June 16th, 1996. For those who don't know, that was Father's Day. Mm. So I had a double blessing that day. Uh, her name is Debney Lachey Groves. Your friends called her D. I mean, Shay. I'm sorry. That's D over there. It was Shay. But between me and her, the DLG stood for Daddy's Little Girl. About four years old, and she was in daycare. She made me this little pot holder, and it had DLG on it, Daddy's Little Girl. I still got it, still use it. I mean, when your kids give you something, you're going to use it. We would go places, out to eat, and we always took turns saying the prayer. That was what we do. We always pray with food. I, I pray once, she prayed once. She was 
just like me, except she's a, she's a girl. She think like me, she act like me, she just had my ways, you know. And my family would tell you that she's, she's just like you, even though temperament was just like me. <laughs> so it is what it is. Uh, so yeah, you know, and everybody, everything I've done, she wanted to do growing up. And when she got a little older, I would always call her my little mini me. So that's how close we were. How has this impacted the rest of your family? Uh, my mom, my dad, her uncles, her aunts, they're, they're devastated. Uh, when she passed away, my mom wasn't able to make it to the funeral. That hurt everyone. You know, it hurt. It hurt. She couldn't. She couldn't make it. You know, uh, her great uncles and great aunts. They're just devastated. You know, someone with so much potential, future, looking bright. I worked hard. Well, me and her mom worked hard for years to educate, educate, educate. That's all we preach. School, school, school. She made it. Got a scholarship to Belmont. About to graduate. Everything was great. I mean, she was a blessed child. She's a loving child. A beautiful child. I'm just, I'm devastated. I'm, I'm devastated. Those are my questions for Mr. Gray. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, our last witness is Cheryl Groves Baker. Could you please state your name and spell your name for the court reporter, please? Cheryl Groves Baker, S H I R L. G R O V E S B A K E R. And ma'am, how are you related to D'Ebony Groves? I am the proud mother of D'Ebony Lachey Groves. Ma'am, how has her murder impacted you? All of my dreams that I've ever had for her to have a successful future just disintegrated in the air on April 22nd, 2018. My days now are spent with scheduled weekly visits to the cemetery, which is usually on Sundays because I pass by going to church and coming back home. Many days of unmanageable tears, I just can't seem to control them continually flowing. a broken heart and a hole in my soul. We got our nails done together. I've also uh, been diagnosed with a skin disorder where my skin is starting to discolorate and it's due to nerves. I struggle even taking a picture because those that know my daughter know she was a photo queen. She took pictures in the laundry room, going to the mailbox, waking up, going to bed, cooking. I mean, she just took so many photos. And I go around and I speak at women's events on her behalf. And every time I post for a picture, I cry. 
What do I have to smile about? She should be here. She should be here under different circumstances. How has her murder impacted the rest of your family? The closeness is still there. But there's always a piece of the puzzle that is missing. And we try to bring it together. We still have family dinners and family outings. We still check on each other, encourage each other. When deep down inside, that one special significant piece will never be able to complete our puzzle. Has it also extended to the impact you've seen on even her sorority sisters? Could you repeat that? Has it even extended to the impact that you've seen on her sorority sisters? Can yeah. you tell us about that? I would like for you to pray one more time. It'll give me time to get my composure together. Right. Have you even seen the impact of her murder on her closest friends or sorority sisters? Yes. And can you describe that? There are several of them here today. And every event that we have had since the Ebony passed, her birthday, the anniversary, Christmas, Mother's Day. They come waiting on me hand and foot. Whatever I need, whatever I want, they're there. And I'd just like to take this time to say thank you to everyone that has prayed on behalf of my family. Because everyone doesn't have a support group and I know that through the prayers and through the support, her legacy is still alive and she will continue to fly high. Those are my questions, Chef. Jury, that concludes the evidentiary portion of the trial. We're going to uh, let me see uh, the attorney, a couple of the attorneys, one from each side, would be fine. <clears throat> There's a couple of legal things I need to address with the attorneys before we, uh, they do their closing. So you'll just step outside. We'll get you back in here as soon as we possibly can. Be seated. Let's go over the instructions that will be provided to the jury before we do closing arguments and make sure we got everything lined up and in order. Is there anything from the state? States has no objections to the way it's been prepared. Defense, I think, Mr. Bruno, you may have 
want to comment on something? There's only one thing, and I don't know in the end if it makes a difference in how they find things, but I think for it to be correct, on page, the bottom of page four, uh, because they have to find the aggravating circumstance, I don't know that it's appropriate to say, to tell them already, however, by your guilty verdict, you've effectively found beyond a reasonable doubt the two aggravating circumstances filed by the state. Because they have to I'll find back. Uh, I'll change that word. I mean, I don't, it affect you know, what they've done, but I understand. I, I, and I don't know that it makes a difference when they actually deliberate, but I think to be proper, I don't know that we should be telling them that they've already met a certain burden effectively. All right, I'll change that. That's what I was going to do. I was going to delete that. Is there anywhere else? No, I, I fully agree. There was actually on page six kind of that same type of wording. I redid it. It's the uh, very first sentence under the uh, verdict, life imprisonment or life imprisonment without possibility of parole, that very first sentence. So I've redrafted uh, it just to say, if you find that the statutory aggravating circumstances have been proven by the state beyond a reasonable doubt. You see? Yes, sir, I agree. That worked? Yes, sir. All right. Let's take about uh, two or three minutes. We'll get these changes made real quick and so we can get them, the printing started for the jury. Judge, if we could actually take about five minutes, that'd be great. Can we do that? Five full minutes. Five full minutes. <laughs> right. 300 seconds. Oh, yeah.